Welcome to Bond Park. I'm Sarah Geidlinger. And I'm Marshall Ward. And today we have Bill Davis. Bill Davis owns Microplay, serving Waterloo Region for nearly 30 years. It's an amazing game store, and uh, I've always said it's like a 20th century pop culture museum. We get to hear about how he started that business. Interesting story. And also about his love for electric vehicles and that he used to be a former sailor. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Bill and I are both passionate about electric vehicles. And uh, anytime I stop into his store, that's what we talk about. But tonight we're going to talk about it here on the podcast. So you can all hear it. Welcome to Bond Park. Welcome, Welcome to, to Bond Park. Park. Welcome to Bond Park. Welcome to Bond Park. Welcome to Bond Park. Do you enjoy Bond Park Podcast? If so, we would really appreciate it if you leave a review, like, rate, subscribe, but most importantly, share directly from the platforms with your family and friends. That's the best way to get the word out to everybody and more people will get to see our show that way. So click those like buttons and share our show. Thank you. Thanks. (laughs) On with the show. This is it. Bond Park is supported by the St. Jacob's Farmer's Market. The market is a community landmark of more than a half century and is the largest year-round farmer's market in Canada. Whatever you crave, you'll find it there. There's country classics like fresh apple fritters, cinnamon rolls, and Oktoberfest sausage on a bun. And new favorites like corn-wrapped vegan tamales, Greek gyros, and blooming onions. With almost 300 food and artisan vendors on site, there's something for everyone, and it makes for a great day trip with family or friends. Stay up to date on hours and events by following the St. Jacob's Farmer's Market on Facebook, Instagram, or at stjacobsmarket.com. And here's a word from Summer. I love going to the market with my family. There's so much to see and do. I love trying all the different foods, and it's a great tradition for our family. Lots of time to get nervous about how it sounds. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, leading up to this, I was kind of a little bit hesitant. And I'll tell you why. It's because I, I, you know, I started listening to uh, a lot of the people that you have, you host and stuff. And I'm going, man, I, like I said in that email, um, you you guys really get some top notch ho- people that to interview. It. Thank you. Our most successful episode was a local teacher who's retired and he was very hesitant to come on and, um, and, and just kept saying to us, I don't know what you want to talk to me about. And that was, our, that's still our most successful episode. Yeah. Most people to episode. loved it. You know? Oh, okay. Good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, I listen to, I do listen to a lot of podcasts. In fact, I probably listen to more podcasts than anything else. And I know that I, one of the ones I listen to is the moth. Do you yes, listen to them? I like the moth. Okay. Yeah. And, and they just get up and they, it's, it's stories told, live in front of a, an audience without yeah. notes and uh and they're tr- supposed to be true so yeah but yeah it's good stuff and it's whenever there's a fumble it's relatable and people are cool with that because you think oh this person's human and they're just telling me a story yeah yeah you know? exactly great yep. mm-hmm. <laughs> so no need to be nervous with us and marshall you know very well anyway yeah mm-hmm. for sure all right bill davis thank you so much for joining us today thank you for having me we're excited to talk to you i want to know how you and marshall met so i met bill Many years ago now, I don't remember when exactly, but uh, I would have come into Microplay, his kitchen location. He has three, one in Guelph, another one in Guelph, and one in Brantford, right, Bill? That's correct. Well, we did have four, but just till recently, we were down to three. And uh, I would have spent some money, you know, a few times. And at some point, I guess I would have struck up a conversation with Bill. And then uh, I guess Bill recognized that I had an electric vehicle and uh, we got off talking about that a lot. And Bill had a lot of questions and I always enjoyed because it was still fairly new to me too, talking about that. And along the way, I had a lot of questions about what it was like to own microplay as well. But 
Um, anyways, guaranteed, if we get together, we're going to talk about electric vehicles probably, which we are going to talk about in this podcast. But I want to kick things off by talking about how you started your career in owning video game stores. Oh, okay. Um, well, good question. Um, there was actually two kind of key factors that, uh, that got me going on it. And um, the, the first one started in, uh, it was November of 1992. Now, at the time, I was working in construction. I did, I did uh, steel, uh, steel siding, so it was commercial steel. And the reason that um, it's kind of pivotal is that at the time, there was a lot of, um, there was, the construction industry was kind of in a downturn because the interest rates were high and there wasn't a lot of, of work out there. So you kind of had to take what you could get. So the, uh, I had my business partner who was my business partner now, who was my employee for about 10 years, him and I, we were sent to a, a job in Brantford. And uh, so we, we get to this job and there was only enough money in the job for one day. Okay. So we had to get in and get out. So, and our job was to work on these balconies. And at the end of the day, we were supposed to put this ridge cap around the top of the, the building. So while we're working on the balcony, it's, it's pouring rain out. And because we had to go into each, uh, each tenant's apartment to get out to the balcony, ended up taking longer than what we thought. So by the time we were done, it was like 10 o'clock at night by the time we actually got up on the roof to finish off the job by putting this ridge cap on. Okay. So we're up on this roof and it had rained all day and there's puddles all around the top of this roof. And the way we, the only way to put this ridge cap on was to lay down on the roof in these puddles and hang over the side of the roof and put this, this cap on while it was blowing out. Cause, and these things are 10 feet long and by the light of the street lights, install these caps. <laughs> And this is after working, well, now I think we're at to like 14 hours on a job that was only supposed to take eight, okay? And we're making very little money, it's raining, and we're like, we feel trapped in this job. So that, boy, I'll tell you, if that doesn't cement um, the, the, <laughs> the inspiration <laughs> to get into something else. <laughs> How about that video game store idea I had? <laughs> yeah. Well, well... We, we were both kind of gamers, and up until that point, Brian, like I said, Brian and I had worked together for about 10 years. He was my employee, and we always talked about what we would do and, and you know, if we got out of siding and, and what else is available and things like that. So, But I tell you, that, that day, it, it cemented it. Like, it, we had to do something different. So what happened was, was you know, about a month or two later, at a New Year's Eve party, we're going around the table and, you know, everybody's giving what they're planning on doing for their New Year's resolution. And I announced to this group of friends, you know, with my wife included in there that I was going to, I was going to open up a game store, or at least I was going to do everything I could possible to, to pursue it. And my wife kind of looked at me and rolled her eyes and went, you know, yeah, right. You know, so, but have another one. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so that was, that was like January 1st. And uh, by May, we opened up our first building or like our, we, we secured our lease. Um, we got the loans. We picked a name. We, um, I spent, oh, months and months driving around acquiring used video games from different people. Um, we built our own cabinets, our shelving. And with the help of a lot of family and friends, we, we opened up May 1st. It was so. And actually, that's the worst time to start a business because May is the slowest time. And we were in a, an area of in, in Guelph that was kind of run down. So we got like cheap rent because half the plaza was empty. And uh, but it, it, it took off from day one. And during that time, my, my business partner, he worked in there um, for a year and then by himself, and then I still did the construction end of things, but I would work there Friday nights and, and, uh, 
and on Saturday. Um, so we did that for a year. And then in um, a year later, we decided, okay, well then now's, now's the time for me to get out of it because now I get my turn at running a store. So we opened up, the next store was in Kitchener and I was at the Florist Glen Plaza. And then we learned how not to open up a store. <clears throat> how so? Because, Tell us the details. Oh yeah, it was, it, was, it was a bit of a disaster because we were paying too much rent. Um, we didn't have enough product. We didn't, I had no idea about how to market anything or, or, and we like, we basically were cash starved. And uh, for, for about a year, we, we were running a deficit. So we weren't making any money and, and it wasn't for lack of trying either. Like I, I was the only person that worked in the store. So I, I worked there from, from, from open to close every day, seven days a week. But it, we, we did everything we could to try and make a go of it. Um, and we found ourselves in the situation where we owed our, our um, suppliers um, a lot of money. And so they said, well, we're not going to give you any product anymore. You got you to gotta clear your bill off first. So um, I, at that point, what I did was I did the worst thing. I, I borrowed more money on a failing business. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you know, you, you, I thought, well, I either, do, I either make a go of it or I don't make a go of it. But what I did was I, I took a course in advertising, which was like the second biggest pivotal point in our career that, um, that I did because it, this guy that I, I went to, I think it was at the KPL library. <clears throat> and one of the, the last thing he said to me, at the end of this, this seminar, he said, the ABCs of, of advertising is number one, get a good product. Number two, price it well. And number three was to advertise the heck out of it. He said, just like advertise, advertise, advertise. So I thought, okay. Um, so what I did was uh, in September, Final Fantasy VII was going to come out. Do you remember Final Fantasy VII, Marshall? Yep, I sure do. So anyway, so I ordered 60 copies of this game and with no money. But the deal was, was I had to write a check for it. So I wrote, I wrote the guy a check banking on the fact that I'd, be able, I'd have enough money to clear the check on Monday after the weekend. So, and then I, I, I put a, a half page out on the newspaper. Um, I got a road sign and then we did a... a a bit in the coupon clipper. So I had three big promotions to push this game. And I, I, amazingly enough, we, it was the pivotal point because we, on, on Monday, I was able to go into the bank and, and put enough money in the, in the bank to clear the check. And I, and I was amazed that I was able to pull that off. So I went, huh, you know, I could probably do this next week too. And I did, I, we did that the next week. And then, so in September, we kept doing that every week where we'd fill the store full of, of product on Friday, banking on the fact that we'd have enough to carry it on, on the Monday. And then, but that was at that time, that's when in 92, that's when you wrote checks for everything. It wasn't like bank deposits or anything. So anyway, so we're really well. Groceries in 92, if I remember. Correctly. <laughs> and Bill in, 19, in 1992, when you say you were a gamer, I guess uh, Nintendo would have been on like their second, or system, I guess, in 92. Have I got that right? Um, well, we, in 92, when we opened, um, we were selling new um, NES games. But at the time, that's when the Super Nintendo and the Genesis were most popular. Yeah, and prior to that, you would have played, what, like Atari, ColecoVision, and Television, those kind of systems? Yeah, yeah. In fact, my business partner and I, we both had Commodore 64s, and then we moved to the Amiga computer. Right. Yeah. And Turbo Graphics would have been in there. Yep. Yep. And the Jaguar was in there. How fun is it running a video game store? Oh, it's a blast. It's a blast. It's uh, my partner and I generally once or twice a month, we'll kind of pinch ourselves and say, you know, we can't believe how fortunate we are to be working in the video game industry. Like it really is cool because it's, like how many other businesses do you have where there's, there's like new product coming out like constantly. It's a lot of fun and yet people, and oftentimes people, our customers know more about the games than we do. 
how many how many businesses do you have where where people will line up at midnight to to try and get a game you know because they can't wait for it to to get it we had there was a number of um, midnight openings that we did where we had I'm trying to think something like 90 people lined up outside the door like all the way around the parking lot and this and this is not in the middle of summer either sometimes like call of duty would come out in november december i think it was november call of duty would come out and it, it's not warm out either like it was people they're dedicated <laughs> and bill your store is like it, it's a couple things it's a first of all it's like a pop culture museum and the, some of the retro stuff that's in there but you've also packed it with like tons of beautiful, colorful plush toys and collectibles and T-shirts and uh, vinyl records and figurines. When did that begin? Did you, um, was that something that happened very slowly or did you, were you already thinking that way when you first opened Microplay and thought, you know, I'm going to make this into something much more than a video game store? Well, there, there, there's a lot of merchandise that is game related that when people start coming in, I was as surprised as as you are about how f- packed the store can get with all this merchandise, like wallets, keychains, uh, hats, t-shirts. It's just, it's amazing how much stuff that people can relate to. Cause it's, we get, um, there is the, f- the fun part is the plush. The plush is amazing because we have people that'll come in and they'll buy a plush doll for their kids once a week. So they're always coming in for new stuff. And once people get used to coming in for one thing, then, you know, it, it's almost self-perpetuating. They start finding other stuff in the store that will grab them. I'm the local haunt. I love what you're saying earlier about getting the word out. Advertising is so incredibly important, but at this point, are you finding a lot of your customers are coming by word of mouth? The video game industry is kind of interesting. I, um, we do have our regular clients, but sometimes, uh, you know, I used to say that um, there wasn't a whole lot of loyalty in the business um, in the sense that uh, oftentimes if I know that if, if someone's coming to my store, I know they're coming, they're probably hitting every video game store in the, in the whole region. And part of the reason is, is what you were getting to before um, Marshall about, about um retro games <clears throat> a lot of times people there's there's a specific game that they're looking for and they'll they'll travel all over the city looking for stuff so it's a huge huge market like tons there's a lot of people that are looking for games and it's not just like our demographics is between generally it's 18 to 35 males but but um there's a lot of um, girls that are interested in it. Um, there's, we get elderly people that are coming in all the time looking for um, games. It's, it's kind of all over the map. Bill, we had on our show very early on um, CJR. Episode five, yeah. CJR, Charlie Rogers, local um, game collector and gamer. He's a YouTube sensation and he has what he believes to be Canada's largest retro uh, and current game collection. I know there was Sid Meier's was a big video game guy. And he had actually a, a, CJR knew Sid Meier's. That's right. Okay. Mm-hmm. And we, we had a lot of dealings with him because he was, he li- lived in Brantford. So we, we actually donated a lot of stuff to, to Sid over the years. And Bill, your staff is wonderful. What are you looking for when you interview and uh, try to find someone who's the right fit for microplay? I, I noticed there's a, they often have a lot of confidence and they're bright, you know, enthusiastic people who I think in some cases know more about some of these games than you do. Oh, oh, for sure. Oh, absolutely. Um, we, we've been really fortunate to have really good staff members. Um, and a lot of times we, we acquire a staff member, but we, we lose a customer because, you know, they, once they're in the store, they get uh, employee discounts and stuff. So, um, but no, we've been, we've been, really quite fortunate and uh, with our staff we have one fellow that's been with us for over 20 years and most of our staff um it's almost like joining a a, a life club you know because most of our staff members they if they leave they, they they'll come back or they they keep coming into the store so we've been fortunate that way 
Bill, uh, what are some of the most popular video games right now? Like for us in our family, The Legend of Zelda is always forefront. But I see our girls playing uh, Animal Crossing and all sorts of other big kind of building games. You know, uh, what's most popular? Well, we, right now? we've been really pleased with how the Nintendo system is. That like the Switch has taken off. Like it's it's done really really well. Like and and Nintendo is is a master at coming out with. They seem to keep coming up with the same stuff all the time, like Mario Kart 8. Well, what they did, well, they came out with the Mario Kart 8 for the Wii U, and then they came out with the Mario Kart 8 Deluxe for the Switch. And there's a lot of games that they're re-releasing on the Switch that originally came out on the, the Wii U, but they're doing, Nintendo's doing really, really well. So probably that is probably the most popular system. And, and partly because you can get machines like the PS5 is popular, but it, hardware, it's, it's hard getting hardware. So that kills the user base because there's just not as many sh- machines out there. And you can get into a switch for if you if it's the light, it's like under three hundred bucks, I think, right? Something like that. Two hundred and sixty dollars, yeah. Two sixty and then you can pick and then up then a used, yeah. Sorry, if it's the full version, it's maybe four hundred bucks, something like that. I'm just kind of ballpark. yeah, yeah, four hundred dollars. Yep. The light ones, and they they love Animal Crossing. It's very much like they're coming from Minecraft. So Animal Crossing is sort of a light and fluffy version of building your own world. So, do you have how many? So you said you had two systems. Do you have more than one game or is it, is it um, the same game that they play? So they each have their own. So they do their own islands. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. Good, good, and good. then they can okay. visit each other. Does this make sense? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. And then there's something yep. about turnips, but don't get me started. I'm not really sure. <laughs> so how old are your kids? Um, oh, sorry. How old are my kids, Marshall? They're 13 and 15. I know it gets complicated because he's changing every year, doesn't it? The age. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It does. <laughs> well, my, my daughter who's 15 keeps saying, I'm I'm almost 16, mom. Mom, I'm almost 16. So it's it's put in my mind now. <laughs> okay. So game gamers grow up with these games that they love, and they have kids and they continue to love the games now with their kids, but they're also nostalgic. Um, do you see kids of let's say age 10 to 12 or something? Are they uh, enjoying retro games as well? Well, the Super Nintendo came out with those two machines, the, the NES Classic and the SNES machine that have 80 games in them. I think the one has 30 and then the other one has 80. And those were all games that were big collector's items, like Secret of Mana and Earthbound. Like those were big, huge games that, you know, were kind of highly sought after for uh, collectors, and and now you can you can pick it up on one console for eighty bucks. So, so those are games that are people are replaying, and those machines were really popular. Um, there are it's it's interesting how the the retro side of things has really taken off, in the sense that um, you'll have guys that are collectors, and they'll they'll collect two or three of the same game just so that they can trade it for something else that they want because they're trying to build up their own collection. And Bill, and that's fun to see. Mm-hmm. Bill, I know it's like Microplay has a, you know, you know pretty much what's going to be in your store as far as what you carry, but there's things that we're not going to see in Microplay. So we're not going to see an Oculus Rift uh, or an Oculus Quest VR gaming. You don't, you're not dealing with the kind of, virtual reality gaming systems. What kind of decision goes into that when you say, well, we're, we're not doing that, you know? Well, we work backwards from the machines that, and platforms that we have. So like we don't sell computers, so we don't sell a lot of PC games, right? And then um, now we do sell the, the headsets for the, the PS4, um, which is 3D, like the VR headsets. So we sell those and, and then we supply the games for them as well. We don't sell the that other stuff. So, I see what you mean because yeah. if, if you were selling that stuff, then you should be selling the gaming computers as well, right? The super powerful. Yeah, you want to be able to support the system if you're selling a machine. Yeah, Bill, uh, where do you think you're going to be at with Microplay five years from now? I've heard you talk about hardware and uh, you know hard copies of games and how things are changing. Can you picture where you're at five years from now? Not, not really, because. Um, 
from day one, we didn't think that the whole industry would last any longer than three years. So when I first started in 92, I thought, well, this will be a three-year project and then I'll see how it goes. And every, every time we, we sign our lease, generally we're signing a five-year lease. And every time we sign our lease, we think, well, hopefully we can get another five years out of this industry. <laughs> and, and, and we've been in the business for, for 30 years now. Well, actually 28 years. So, and, and I still, you know, it's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> Bill, now oh, I, I, I like to believe that the, 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 the whole industry has legs, but, uh, but it keeps, it's expanding. And I think the, the video game, uh, like the bricks and mortar part of it is getting smaller. When I come into your store, almost immediately, like I said early on, is that we strike up a conversation about electric vehicles because you showed a lot of interest in my Nissan Leaf when I first started showing up at your store. And uh, I always figured eventually you would get an electric vehicle. In fact, I think your, your first one was an electric bike, but you dr- now drive an electric car, right? I do. I, I drive both. I have e-bikes and I have an electric car. <laughs> Okay, well, t- tell us about your car and your journey into owning an electric vehicle. Well, the the journey started with with you actually. You were the one who kind of inspired me because coming into you you coming into the store and telling me that you actually had two vehicles and you could hardly wait to get them that that was that was cool. So, um, and then I think you told me some of your reasons for getting it was that it was mostly environmental, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? For sure. And I would have also mm-hmm. shared with you some of the, the learning curve along the way. So, uh, so yeah. So number one was you inspiring me to get one. So that kind of put the, you know, started the, me thinking about it. And, um, um, and then, you know, you start doing research on it and one thing leads to another. Um, and then the more books that I read and, and, you know, about environmental concerns, that kind of, kind of tip the scale a bit too um as far as getting a a, a unique car and th- number three was a, it's like it's just really cool like i like i love new technology and stuff so it was kind of fun so what did you buy well i got a 2017 nissan leaf so that's right. what we landed on so um but it was it was kind of it was it was actually what i did was i i traded in my wife's car for for the leaf and it took a lot of convincing because my wife loved her car. <laughs> it was, it was a red Hyundai and she Elantra and she just loved it. And I said, okay, so what I want to do is I want to, I want to trade your car in for a car that has gives you less mileage, you know, as far as um, how far it'll go. And she said, and why are we doing this? And I said, well, because it's, it's fun. It's cool. And she goes, I, I, don't want that. I just want my Elantra. And so anyway, I, I can be really persistent and, and she's, she's, she's a trooper. Like, <laughs> so it was, um, it was December 20th and that's a good time to buy a car because um, not a lot of dealers are selling cars around Christmas. So you can usually get a pretty good deal. And uh, so we got a good trade in on the, her Elantra, you know, um, much to Jill's dismay. And, uh, and it also, so it had less than 10,000 kilometers on it and it came with a number two charger right in the, in the trunk. So I didn't have to buy that. So, and then my son who happens to be an electrician was able to help me hook it all up in the garage. So. Oh, sweet. So it, yeah. Yeah. And the other cool thing was, was that we bought the car in the winter and, and the, with an electric car that the range in, in the winter is, is not as good. And so we kind of got used to only being able to drive about a hundred kilometers and then we'd have to plug it in and, and stuff. And then my goodness, when, when summer hit, it was just like, you know, the range that we got, like compared to what we were doing in the winter was, it was, it wasn't quite double, but oh my goodness, it was, I, I was looking at the, the mileage and thinking like, is this thing working? You know, like you tap it because it, it, it seemed to go forever. Did you find that too, Marshall, when in the winter? Yeah, there's a huge summer? difference between winter and summer. Yeah. yeah. And there's other challenges too. Like uh, we would leave our car out in the driveway because there's too much crap in the garage. And then, okay. dun, dun, dun. And then, and then the, ha- the hatch would, uh, on a freezing rain day, get frozen up. The way you pop the hatch in the front to plug it in. And now you've got a real problem. Now there's ice in there. 
So we've had a few experiences where our car had to get towed to Nissan to get warmed up and get that ice out of there. Or in one case, like you don't leave the Nissan Leaf at 15% in the driveway when it's minus 30 degrees. Because they'll just be dead then. Yeah, it's like leaving and taking your appliance outside. Did you, Marshall, did you find that you would plug it in every time like as soon as you came home you would plug it in every time or did you right so i i like doing that but uh i remember the dealer at nissan saying you don't want to charge it all the way up to 100 every time you know you want to keep it somewhere between 20 and 80 so i would try to do that but uh, i did find something very comforting about plugging it in mm-hmm. and knowing it was plugged in all night kind of like mm-hmm. yeah i guess keeping it warm <laughs> <laughs> i would plug mine in i wouldn't plug it in every time but you kind of have to kind of plan where you're going because if you're going to go for a long trip, are you going to be, be you know, taken off and making lots of stops and you know going here and going there? Then you, you kind of want to make sure that it's reasonably has a reasonable full charge. The way I do it is if it's below fifty percent, I plug it in whether whether I need it or not. So, Marshall, let's take a minute to hear from this week's sponsor, the Saint Jacobs Farmers Market and their vendor TWB Brewing. TWB's story began with a vision to create a business rooted firmly in the local community. And what better way to create community than with craft beer? They envisioned making the craft beer scene more approachable and accessible for everyone to enjoy. And that also extended to their business model. As a worker-owned cooperative, business ownership became more accessible as well. Let's hear from Alex Shaflarska herself. Hello, my name is Alex. I'm one of the founding worker owners of Together We're Bitter. We're a tiny um, brewery out of Kitchener, Ontario, and we just turned five this February. Uh, So we are one of two cooperative breweries in Ontario, the other being our friends at London Brewing Cooperative. Uh, So what we do is we bring democracy to the workplace in the way that we're run. So basically we started with six wacky individuals who saw a need for craft beer and a reason to do it differently in Kitchener. Uh, Since then we grew to 10, then shrunk to 8. It's a fluid model, but it's one where everyone who is a worker owner gets a voice and can run for the board and has a say in how the business is run. And everyone who works at TWB has a chance at becoming a worker owner after two years of work at our business. I love TWB beer, and uh, two of my favorites have got to be the tart thing, sour rye. It's just so uh, punchy and fruity and delicious. It's uh, It's got nice gentle tartness over a smooth multi rye ale. And uh, the other favorite is the Sundog Saison. It's light and flavorful. It's a Belgian beer, and it's perfect on a hot summer day. It has a fantastic banana character and uh, notes of hoppy citrus and fruit. Uh, So at TWB, we like to offer a wide variety of different kinds of ales and lagers, uh, focusing on quality ingredients, small batch beers. uh, And we often like to have everything from, you know, a dark stout, like we currently have our patio stout out, which is super delicious, nice and roasty, uh, a great dark beer. And we run the gamut from that to something like a, like our crispy pills, which is a nice lager, um, perfect for that afternoon on a patio uh, where you just want something light and refreshing. So our goal is with the you know five to ten beers that we have on tap at any given time to have something for everyone. So we like to have everything from those dark beers to the ambers through to the light ones. One of my favorites that we have on right now is called the Volk Summer Kottbusser. Uh, it's a mouthful, but um, it's a delicious mouthful. The Kottbusser is an old German style ale that used to be very popular before the Bavarian purity laws came into place because it was meant to be a light ale where you could add things to it. We add ginger and honey to ours. Um, so it's a really, really great, nice, light, refreshing beer. And it's a style that doesn't get made very often, but ties into, you know, Kitchener and Waterloo's kind of German connection. <laughs> uh, and it's something that we're proud to bring to the region and, and offer among our various beers. TWB is relatively new to the St. Jacob's Farmer's Market in the Peddler's Village. Let's hear from Alex about what it's like to be part of this community. We love it. Um, it's such a great community. We've gotten to know our neighboring vendors here. We've gotten to know some regulars. We're excited to be in a space that really uh, builds connections, builds community, and allows us to connect with people who may not stumble upon our tiny brewery on Mill Street in Kitchener, uh, you know, on their afternoon walk. (laughs) So this is a way to meet new people, get new people out to our space. 
and make those connections and get our beer into the fridges of you know people across the region. So don't forget to visit TWB at the St. Jacob's Farmer's Market located in Peddler's Village right across from A Taste of Greece. And now back to the show. So then when you're planning those trips, because I have a gas guzzler car, when you're planning those trips, like where are you finding the, the stations? Oh, there's tons of apps that will tell you where all okay. the, the charging stations are. I'm not in, fact, in the know. There are there are 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 apps that you, you plug in where you want to go, like Google Maps, and it'll show you where all your stops are. And you, oh. you plug in you plug in what car you have and it'll even figure out how much range you have and where you need to stop. Okay, that's pretty awesome. There's other <laughs> things too, like there's there's subtle things that are happening. One is uh, like the Voicens who own the Boardwalk shared with me how their Sun Country charging station, which is free. Thank you for that, Boardwalk. Um, they keep it, they'll charge your car faster. So they've invested, like it's kind of like turning it up kind of thing. So mm. you'll be quite happy when you come and pull away from there. But if you went to a, a couple other malls that we know of here, if they've got a free one, they're You're not waiting. they're not giving you all the juice, okay. right? So there's little things like that. And then you can also show up at malls and you'll find the, the ones called Flow which want to charge you, you need a special card. And mm. I don't know about you, Bill, but I'm not, I'm not buying into that. I'm not paying for to park at a mall. I haven't yet. I haven't yet. But if I want to go from, you know, from a destination that my car is not capable of doing, I, I'd like to try and um, do that where you, you get the level three chargers where, you know, you, you plug it in for 20 minutes and it gives you 80% and off you go. And uh, Bill, talk about the driving of the car. For me, what really blew me away when I first tried a Nissan Leaf was it's it's very zippy. Like you hit the gas and boom, you go. Like if, mm. if you were at a stop sign or a red light with somebody and you need to get ahead of them, no problem, right? And uh, But also, it, also I was going to say, um, uh, it, it's a very smooth ride as well, right? It's I like driving it better than my, my gas car. Like I have a, a Subaru. And when I drive the Subaru, it's kind of clunky and, you know, but when I get in the, the leaf, oh, it's, it's, it's zippy. It's a quick car. It's, it's fun to drive. Like, I like it. It feels like a remote and control car. Is it? Yeah. yeah. Well, and the other cool thing is, is that because it's electric, it's quieter. It's really quiet. So now with my car, it's the 2017 and it's got the, the bug eye headlight lights on it like you have that too right marshall i do yeah and the reason they said they have that was to deflect the the air that comes around the rear view mirrors like the or sorry the side view mirrors so so and it's all in an effort to keep it quiet so interesting yeah the quiet is tricky it can be in a, especially if i'm picking up my uh, daughters from high school and there's a whole pile of kids getting out you basically have to crawl behind them in the car because they don't hear the car right they got the hoods on and they're maybe yeah, headphones. Yeah. And it's just and they all have headphones. Same with the grocery store, trying to get out of the grocery store. And they're headed over to my yeah, you, you don't want to. That's right. You don't want to honk at them. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, you don't want to be the, the old guy honking at the teenagers in the parking no. lot. <laughs> you're, um, now, it, if you back up, it's got the beeping noise. Yeah. But when you're going forward, it's it's like stealth. It's quiet. And what we find is that like around we live out in the country and there's a lot of people that walk on the roads and stuff and when we're coming along they don't hear you they don't hear you at all so mm -hmm. you really have to slow down because sometimes people will jump out of the way because they all of a sudden you're there we're so used we're so conditioned to hearing the, the rumble of a car right well i'll have to get used to that it's also a very heavy car so there's no body roll when you right. go around corners it's like right. a, a matchbox or a hot wheels car fashion <laughs> like all heavy and smooth on the bottom bill yeah. tell me about your e-bike where are you using this what was the what was the pull to get one? I used to have a sailboat. Okay. Wait so, a minute. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. I'm with you. you had a, we're talking about bikes, but you okay. had a sailboat. Okay. I know. I had a sailboat <laughs> and my wife said, you got to get rid of the sailboat. And I said, well, if I get rid of the sailboat, I want to buy a motorcycle. And she said, okay, you can buy your motorcycle. So I sold the boat. We bought a motorcycle. I drove it and I hated it. I didn't like it. I thought, you know how you ever buy something you, and the idea of something is better than the actual doing? All so, the time. And, and Well, I shouldn't say I didn't like it, but it was. I found the, the, the motorcycle too intimidating. When I was younger and bulletproof, it was fine. But, you know, now that I'm older and, you know, realize that, you know, 
I'm not going to live forever and I could die at any time. <laughs> I, uh, so, so I sold that and we picked up two e-bikes and my wife just loves it. She's, she's more of a, a fanatic than I am. Like she'll, like even today, this afternoon, it was raining out and she said, well, let's go. Maybe it will, maybe it'll stop. So we went, we went out for a bike ride. So, and, it, and the nice thing about the e-bikes is that um, you still get a good workout and because it's only pedal assist, but if you're, if you're going against the wind, you can, you can add more juice to the, to the back end, which, you know, will compensate for the wind. So you can still kind of maintain a certain speed. Um, it's nice going up hills. Um, so no, we, we like it. We really, really enjoy it. And you, can, did you guys get, Oh, sorry. I speak over you. Oh no, no, no. That's okay. Um, the, she, she's actually on her third e-bike that we've gone through because I bought one for her and then it wasn't, it was just a used one. And then I got a new one, but it was too high. My wife's only four eleven, So I ended up getting a townie. Um, so townie. And, okay. Yeah. The, the cool thing about the townie is that the pedals are kind of forward a bit. So, um, because my wife's really short when she stops, she can put her legs, she can put her feet on the ground as opposed to having to step off the bike. So, mm -hmm. so. That is important. That's an important yeah. part of cycling. Sure. <laughs> and what kind of range do you get on the bike? That's a good question. Um, we can do about, well, it, some, it's similar to the, the leaf. It depends on how you drive it and temperatures and all that stuff. But generally, um, we're, we can get about 100 kilometers out of the bike. That's pretty good. So the, the bike will go farther than my butt will because generally <laughs> Usually it's the about, comfort that's bringing you home. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> after have, 60 kilometers, I'm, I'm done. You're done. <laughs> have, have you seen what's coming for Nissan, uh, in their line of EV, uh, vehicles that we've got the, uh, 2022 Nissan area, which is, uh, like an SUV, like hatchback and it can go nearly 500 kilometers. Wow. Nice. Yeah. So $40,000. So, yeah. So is that going to be your next vehicle possibly? I don't know. I've always dreamed of having a bigger vehicle than we've always had small mm -hmm. Mazda and Toyota and Nissan vehicles. So I'd love to have something bigger. Have you seen? Yeah. Have you seen, um, have you ever looked at, uh, like, a, a, like a Tesla because of the, the longer range? Like right now they're getting, they said the new Tesla can get over 600 kilometers. Yeah. I never thought that was in our price range, but maybe one day. Yeah, I don't have Tesla money either. In fact, I could have for I probably could have bought um, three Leafs for what you know I paid for my <laughs> for mm -hmm. what it would have cost me for a Tesla. <laughs> when you uh, buy a, an electric vehicle, I know how my feelings about it. But do you ever think this is interesting? I'm only a vehicle that you don't re nobody really understands yet how long it will last for, how long that big battery will last for, and. You kind of just, I think just people just picture, I'm just going to drive it till it's done, you know, as opposed to mm -hmm. maybe people think about their gas vehicles like that too. But have you thought, well, we do. have you thought much about that in terms of you're kind of driving something where there are a lot of unknowns? He's probably thinking not till now, Marshall. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> well, you know, part of me, I, I like I said before, I, I like the new technology, but um, sometimes like you have to pay for that. So Generally, I like to kind of stay behind the technology a little bit by about two or three years. So that's so probably what I'll it. yeah. So probably what I'll end up doing is I'll probably trade my leaf in for you know in maybe two or three years for something that's you know two or three years old kind of thing and kind of go that route. Isn't that the golden rule for jumping on the technology bandwagon? You just, you wait a few releases until the bugs are worked out. Yeah. And then well, you, they say that the leading in. edge is the bleeding edge, right? Yeah. So. <laughs> That's, good saying. That's perfect. Hey, uh, let's come back to microplay here yeah. as we start to wind down. I have a few microplay questions. Yeah. And uh, how do those three stores that you own right now differ? So we're talking Kitchener, Brantford, and Guelph. What's, uh, what's different about those three stores? Oh, um, well, a lot of times the the store will take on the flavor of the, the employees. A lot of times um, we, we try to, we try to do our best to, to maintain consistency be between the stores. And uh, 
so by consistency, I mean like pricing and, and policies and structure and, but, but you can't, every, every manager has his own kind of self-interest and we allow the managers to, um, to take control over what they want to get in because they have a, a better feel for what customers are looking for. And as a result, like one store will, will go huge on, on trading cards and, you know, another store will be big on plush and another store will be big on sports titles. So, so sometimes that's, you know, the difference between, you know, the three, but, you know, but, but having said that, we, we also move inventory around. So if something's not selling in one store, we can move it to another store. Or if one store is doing really well on say cards and he's got lots of them, he can move those to other stores too, just to kind of feed them. So but that's a good question. That's interesting that you mention, um, you know, letting the managers sort of run how the the product and the store is going to be taken care of. That's kind of a common theme when we talk to local business owners, where they just seem to hire good people, train them as well as they can, and trust them to take it forward. Trust them that they know what they're doing and that um, they might know those customers that are coming in the door every day a little bit better than you do instead of trying to micromanage or control every tiny little aspect of it. We've been, we've been really fortunate with really good staff, like I said before. And most times um, what we find is that if you allow the staff members to kind of take control and allow them to make decisions on their own, then what happens is that they, they kind of take ownership of the store and and it, it becomes very personal for them to make sure that the store does well, which is good for everybody. Mm-hmm. So. I think about uh, Jonathan, who's worked at your Kitchener location for a while now. Mm-hmm. He's such a genuinely nice guy. Like as, aside from just stellar customer service and knowledge, he's instantly likable. And uh, is that something you're able to spot kind of right away in a job interview? Or maybe you knew him beforehand as a customer? Uh, no, no. But, but with Jonathan... Yes, I did. He was, he came, I remember the interview with him and I, cause when I, when I hired him on first, I said, okay, I got a part-time position for you. Okay. But, but I want to move you into full-time by Christmas. So like, hang on, like, don't find anything else until, <laughs> till Christmas. And he said, no, no problem. I'll, I'll be there. And he, he was true to his word. He, he started with us part-time. We moved him into full-time and he's been, exceptional he's been a really solid employee and really sharp too like he doesn't miss a thing and now that we're you know through covid we had to move to kind of an online presence with uh microplay um so all all three stores inventories are all up online now through uh microplayvideogames.ca and he's been really good as far as catching stuff that i've missed so he's been really solid help for that so that's great when we interviewed mark logan who's owned encore records for encore has been around for 40 years now he talked about how you know you can sit in a a record store for 40 years and people think it's a dream job and he says in in some ways he, he agreed it or acknowledged it was but he also said a lot of it is a grind a lot of it is a lot of paperwork and ordering and shipping and ordering and trying to figure out what the store needs and spending money he doesn't have. While it, watching it, some customers price check on Amazon while they're standing in the store looking at the product. Right. You know. is, is microplay, is, is that, does that kind of echo what a part of your life is like too, where, you know, it's, it's not as glamorous as someone may think? Well, I don't think any, any job or very few jobs are, are kind of like a walk in the park, you know, you, and we, we get you get your share of of customers that are are really challenging and it can it can really kind of mess up your day for you know like it can mess you up for a day or two because you want to be you want to be friendly and nice with everybody and there is that there are customers that are can give you a hard time and sometimes like the other day um, we ended up bringing in oh I'm trying to think now there was like 200 plush toys so jonathan had to sort them all out and bag them all up for the other stores and 
and it it's a lot of work it's a lot of work <laughs> this is plush toys and not like i don't know pet tarantulas or something like that <laughs> yeah i want to ask i want to ask you about some of the retro systems so there's like mm. a few atari ones and you clico and uh, i don't know what else is oh there's a commodore 64 one and bill for me so i love i loved all those systems but something that is missing for me is I'll go read the reviews of them and they often don't get a lot of stars. It talks about how lightweight they are, how they're kind of can be glitchy. The joysticks are too, again, too lightweight. They don't move the way they remember the old Atari joysticks. I always think to myself, man, I don't like, I understand they want to put them out for like $99 or whatever, but I always think to myself, if someone could make a really great one for 300 bucks and have it heavy and feel like it, the original, um, I would buy that. Um, do you find that? Do you ever think to yourself, okay, you can kind of see why they went this way, but it might do better if they put more, uh, I don't know, tried to make it like it was an old system. Um, okay. So I'm trying to understand. So you're saying, why don't they make retro games more, more robust? Yeah, exactly. So if I went to the antique market and they opened the glass and I picked up an old Atari system, it would be heavy, right? And the joystick would have weight to it. And what turns okay. me turns me off is the lightweightness of it all. You know, like there's a part of me that wants it just to feel like it did when I I played it as a kid. Well, if you if you pick up a, a PS5 controller or a, a an Xbox th- Xbox Series X controller, it's it's heavy, like it's beefy. There's a lot in there, and there's it's an amazing technology that goes into these controllers like there's microphones in them and and they're bluetooth and they got touch pads on the front of them and they got lights and oh it's it's incredible they even have um when you pull the trigger if it's a shooting game it'll give resistance on the trigger like it's it's amazing that how far they've come with controllers and i've i've played some of the older retro games like um super smash or not, um, hang on, you have to add that, that out, <laughs> not Super Smash, um, Street Fighter. And they're, the control on them is awful. Like, I, you, you know, you pound buttons and sometimes they move and sometimes they don't. You try and jump and they don't jump. And, and I, I just, I found that when I started playing retro games, I found that, you know, it was more the idea of it was, it was exciting back then, but compared to what we have now like we've come a long way yeah so when i see those those boxes like let's say an atari that's made today and there's pitfall and all these games that just fill my heart with joy when i see the artwork okay just i just i just wish the system that was in that game was in that box was something like you said more robust you know something Mm -hmm. that i take home i'm gonna be really happy with it so it's a bit of a, a a play you know on a bit of a trick i think now, what they do sell also is they sell um, the start stand-up arcade style games, like the machine. So you can buy a like a, a stand-up machine um, with the joysticks and the monitor in the back and stuff. And, and yeah, so those I've, have those I've, controllers are amazing. I've got the tabletop arcade one up Pac-Man, and it's awesome. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. But, but you, you have to pay yep. you have to pay three hundred bucks for it. Yeah. I thought they were more than that, but anyway. oh, the, I'm talking. I'm talking the tabletop one. It's, it's oh, a really, gotcha. The gotcha. really big ones are gotcha. six and seven hundred. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's exactly it. And Do we were a, oh, go ahead. Well, we were going to sell those in the store because one of our suppliers was um, had them, but we it becomes a an issue with space. Like, where do you put it? Mm. Mm-hmm. You have to open up an arcade then. <laughs> that's a different business. <laughs> Um, Bill, do you personally have a retro game collection? I don't. You don't, because nope. you've got the nope. stores. So yeah. you mentioned a few of the older systems both of you did, and I'm I'm familiar with some of them, not all of them. But Bill, what's your first video game memory of you playing something? Um, okay, let me think about this for a minute. We're just consulting with the archives. Mm-hmm. Okay, the, 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 yeah, the the big game for me was was I kind of got started on on my love for video games back in the Genesis era with with Sonic. So I had three boys all within three years. So they're 
let me think, I think it would be 92. So they were like 10, 11 and 12 at the time. And so that was prime, you know, video game time for these guys. And um, so we would get Sonic and they would play that to death. And then, and I, what I did was I got all my relatives. I can't remember if I said this before, but I got all the relatives to buy them video games because um, the, the cool thing was, was that if, when they were done with them, we could trade them back in for, for newer games. And I wasn't left with all these abandoned toys in my basement that never got used again. So, so probably the Genesis and the Super Nintendo were, were what kind of hooked me for video games and got me started in the, the whole, you know, making a career out of it kind of thing. Here you are trading all these games and you're thinking, Hmm, there must be other guys like me out here <laughs> out there that need to do this too. I thought we'd uh, take this podcast home with this. I'll try to explain this question first. It goes like this. Um, I used to visit Jumbo Video in Waterloo. Uh, not daily, but pretty close. Me too. And there were two guys that owned it. One of them was uh, Ward Pudney, and he was uh, about 60 years old. And I remember saying to him a long time I, ago. I remember Ward. He had long hair. Yeah, yeah, Ward's awesome, right? And I remember <laughs> saying to Ward, Ward, do you think you can ride this uh, Jumbo Video store to retirement? And then, you know, settle down. He said, well, no, we won't be here in two years, he said to me. And I couldn't believe it. I, I, I had no idea what he was talking about. And he started saying how we'll, Blockbuster will start to disappear. This is what's going to happen. And I, I thought, why are you talking like that? What do you mean the video, video rentals and DVD rentals won't be around in two years? And he just said to me, they just won't be. And that's exactly what happened. But right around uh, the time that Blockbuster uh, turned down Netflix. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but in your case, Bill, do you think about that in terms of you might be able to ride your video game stores to retirement uh, and uh, kind of, uh, you know, wrap up an amazing career with your electric vehicles in your parking lot. And maybe, you know, just, are, is that what you imagine could happen? Well, <clears throat> currently I'm, I'm, I'm 62 years old and I've been in the business for 28 years. And last year I told my business partner that I was going to retire in April, which was one month ago. <laughs> so, and, and I'm still here. How's that going for you? <laughs> well, what happened was, was with COVID, we ended up launching a, an online business. So I've taken care of, I've taken that. So basically I'm not even in the stores anymore. My, my job now is, is the online presence. So, and so rather than retiring, I ended up taking on another career almost because now it's all all I do is online stuff. So along with, but the, the online stuff is tied in with, with marketing. Like, so, so I do Facebook, Instagram, uh, email blasts, and that all ties in with our online store. And how are you feeling about that? The idea of, you know, wrapping up your career at some point and, and being done with the, the stores. Um, well, I'm kind of excited. I, I don't think anybody on their deathbed ever says, oh, I wish I would have spent more time working. <laughs> but, but like I said, I, I love what I do. And, and um, that's why the decision to, to kind of let it go to someone else is, is tough. So, so but anyway, um, we'll see what, see what the future holds. Hey, all thanks for meeting us in Bond Park. Please like, rate, and subscribe to our podcast on the platform that you're listening to. And follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Bond Park Podcast. Original music by Alan Lung. <laughs>